Um, so my research centers on the development of mathematical tools to address open problems in virology. So, um, and in particular, um, I like to show you today that mathematics can really be an asset in the fight against viruses. Viruses are a real burden for the public health sector. We've already heard in the first talk how important infectious diseases are in mortality. But to give you a couple of examples to, to bring that home even more, um, more than 35 million people are infected with HIV. And in 2013 alone, over 1.5 million die from the disease. Also, think about hepatitis B, 240 million people infected and 780,000 dying from the consequences of that disease. So it is clear that we need new and unconventional solutions to deal with that problem. So, as I said, I'm a mathematician and I work very closely with experimentalists. And what we are interested in is understanding these viral containers, they're called viral capsids. They encapsulate the genomic material and act like Trojan horses. They transport the viral genomic material into the host cell and trigger an infection. And what we would like to understand better is how they are actually formed. So when you look at the surfaces, you can already see why a mathematician is excited about those viruses, because you see this highly regular organization here. And there are what we call symmetry properties. So symmetry, you know, when you look at your body, you've got a reflection symmetry. But what we're talking about here are axes, for instance, through opposite vertices. And when you rotate around these axes, the structure stays the same. We say it's invariant. So what we really like to understand is how do these structures form? How do these regular building blocks come together to form those viral containers? And the discovery that we have made with our colleagues is that they are actually cryptic signals hidden in the genomes of many viruses, like these red identities here. When they, are, when they occur, when they're expressed in the context of geometric shapes like those ones here, we call them secondary structures, then they can act collectively to enhance the formation of these viral containers. And this discovery has been likened by the press earlier this year as the equivalent of cracking the viral enigma. And the reason perhaps is that these signals are really very cryptic. This is due to the fact that there is a very strong variety in the structures, as you can see across those examples, and also in the sequences that are important for this recognition event. So a straightforward Kant bioinformatics approach would not be enough to address that problem and to uncover those signals. But by using mathematics, in addition, you can actually get at that problem and, and make inroads into this. So in order to do this, we really need to understand better virus structure. From an experimental point of view, we use cryo-electron microscopy. You see here an example of what we would get from this experimental technique. You see the viral container on the outside, and inside you see density of RNA. And what is really critical to understand is how this RNA is organized. So what people would do is to take multiple such copies of a virus with many, many different viruses and align those data according to their symmetry axes. And if you do so, then you can see close to the capsid, in proximity to capsid, an organization that looks pretty much like this polyhedral shell. So again, you see why the mathematician is extremely excited about this. So the way to see this is like a roadmap for what's going on in the organization of this virus. In these vertices, you have those contacts between the RNA and the protein sitting that are critical for the formation. But that is a picture if you look at many particles averaged, as we say. But in a single particle, you would have only one way of connecting those binding sites. And from a mathematical point of view, this would present itself like such a pass. We call it a Hamiltonian pass. Now, we developed Hamiltonian pass techniques in the group using this branch of mathematics called graph theory and arrived at an astounding prediction. The organization of the genome in proximity to capsid is highly constrained in viruses, 
much, much more constrained than we previously appreciated. And actually, there's only a small number of dominant such organizations, and therefore, by consequence, dominant ways of building up these capsids that we can pinpoint. And that has subsequently been also verified experimentally. But the real excitement for us was that this provides you a handle to solve this enigma problem. Because if you now combine this with bioinformatics and some information from experimental studies, what constitutes a good RNA binder to protein, you are actually able to pinpoint those cryptic signals. And that's the first virus in which we actually did that. And here is the solution for that. So the way we depict it is the genome is depicted as a linear sequence here. And every little bar is the position of one of those signals. We can pinpoint them all. And also here in the so-called secondary structure, it's the fold you're getting, this geometric shape you again see where they are located. Now, when you look at this picture, you see that I color code those locations, and there's actually reason to that. Because this structural variation that we've seen has a biological reason, a bio biological function. It leads to the fact that the affinity, as we say, of those packaging signals to the capsid proteins is different for different such signals. So there's a different probability of attachment for different signal types. And mathematics can also help to explain why this is actually important. So this is a very, very simple model. What we do as mathematicians, we cook like spherical cows, as we call them. So a very simple virus would be a dodecahedral shell. I'm also wearing one as a necklace today for good measure. So this is a shape that is uh, constructed from 12 pentagonal shapes that are representing the protein building blocks here. And each and every one of those can actually bind to any of those 12 binding sites on our hypothetical RNA. Now, what we're interested in is to understand when we're varying the affinities of those packaging signals for the code proteins, what is the consequence for the efficiency of the formation of the shell? So what we have done in the first instance is to take 30,000 randomly chosen such sequences in three bands. So we are color coding high affinity binders in green, low affinity binders in red, and intermediate as blue. And we assess their respective ability to efficiently form these containers. And the first thing you see is that there is actually quite a widespread. So the x-axis is the efficiency of formation. And on the y-axis, you count how many have that respective efficiency. And you see, actually, that it varies quite strongly between almost 100% to, on the other end of the spectrum, just above 70%. Now, in a real viral infection, you don't have viruses assembling in isolation. In particular, they would assemble against the backdrop of these cellular competitor RNAs that can also be encapsulated. So. We actually run that experiment in the computer in competition. And you see something that is surprising at first, because you see that these cellular RNAs, these competitor RNAs, are much, much more efficient than the viral ones in producing viable particles. So that obviously can't be right, because in a real viral infection, this process is very efficient. But inspired by seminal work by Eigen, who was a very important person in this area on viral life cycles, we realize that there are other features of the overall process that are very important here. And one of them is the fact that capsid protein is actually not readily available. You don't have all these pentagons all at once available in this process. They are getting synthesized gradually. So if you build this in, so you, you synthesize protein while you're already assembling, you suddenly see that assembly efficiency is highly, highly efficient, nearly 100%, no more misencapsidation and little malformation. So why am I telling you this? Because it was a pivotal moment for us. There were many, many years where people did in vitro studies to understand virus assembly. And these packaging signals have never been observed. There has been uh, the belief even that they would not exist. But actually, if you carry out experiments in the presence of such a protein rump, they suddenly present themselves. And our colleague, Peter Stockley, with whom we are 
working closely on this work, actually carried out such experiments. And he was then able to show for the first time that these packaging signals are actually important cooperatively. Their spacings, their shapes, all of that is important to uh, achieve this high efficiency in assembly. Now, that is really important for us because um, it helps us to get at this, this mechanism. And this mechanism I would li like to liken with a self-packing suitcase. I really wanted to show you this because I absolutely like this analogy. You can forget everything I've said and just remember the self-packing suitcase because indeed, um, as my colleague says, <laughs> when viral RNAs and viral <laughs> proteins are mixed together, the proteins leap onto the RNA and fold it up neatly. It is as if the suitcase and the contents pack themselves. So that's really what's going on here, so we've got. But we're really excited about this also from the point of view of drug therapy because it opens up new avenues for us. We have used our modeling context to assess what happens when you target selected groups of those packaging signal sites with a drug. And you can see that dependent on the drug concentration, you get various levels of malformations and misencapsidation, which suggests that this should be a good avenue for drug design. And indeed, this is not just a theoretical exercise. Peter has shown in the lab that a licensed drug can actually bind to such RNA structures and inhibit virus assembly both in vitro and in vivo, and ultimately ablate it all together. So this means that we have actually jointly discovered a new drug target and the University of York has filed a patent together with the universities of Leeds and Helsinki where all the experimental colleagues are who have been involved in this work. And this patent explicitly indicates the structures of these signals for a large group of viruses, predominantly RNA viruses, but also some DNA viruses that package the genomic material as so-called pre-genomic RNA. So these are actually viruses that follow similar assembly mechanisms, even though their overall setup is very different. So we're very excited about following this up at the moment and then talking to industry to take this further. So I'd like to conclude my talk by thanking all the people who are involved in this work. First and foremost, Peter Stockley. It's been a joint adventure over the last decade, and we are especially excited at the moment because just before Christmas, we've been awarded jointly a Wellcome Trust Investigator Award to continue this investigation into packaging signals. Now, for the first time, look at their roles at different stages of the viral life cycle and really broaden up the search for these packaging signals in much larger classes of viruses. And my very special thanks go to my wonderful team. They are spreading expertise from mathematics, bioinformatics, biophysics, the very vibrant atmosphere. And I would like to thank specifically Eric Dijkman. He started off as a postdoc in my group, but is now a lecturer here in York, and we are continuing this work on this, on this project together. And finally, none of this would have been possible without generous funding from a number of funding bodies, in particular the Lieberholm Trust, the Wellcome Trust, EPSSC, and BBSSC. Thank you.